Okay, so this week we're going to take a look at uh, some of the ways that healthcare has been enshrined into law. Uh, and I'd like to give us kind of a, a, a little bit of an overview of the policy and lawmaking processes because uh, part of what we're going to take a look at is a book by Barbara Sinclair called Unorthodox Lawmaking and the case study that that has about the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and um, that was done in a very unorthodox manner, hence it was included in a book called Unorthodox Lawmaking. Uh, but I'd just like to give us a brief overview in the event that you have not had kind of uh, an overview of the policy process, you didn't take a policy class in undergraduate. Uh, so I've got here um, one of the kind of most predominant models that's used in studying public policy uh, and one that I use in my public policy classes. Uh, there's a, a, a scholar named James Anderson who has a very popular textbook and he has what's called a stage model of the policy process. And this isn't necessarily always the way that the system works, uh, but it's a good way to understand and break down how policies are actually kind of done by Congress and by the President at the national level. So for example, you've got five stages and he simply sets them up as being stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, stage five. And everything moves sequentially through these different five stages. Uh, and then there's what we call a feedback loop that le leads back to the front. So let's take a look at what these five stages are so that you understand a bit about how policy is made. So the first thing uh, is the idea of the policy agenda. And Anderson describes them as those policies among many that receive the serious attention of public officials. Uh, and in kind of common sense terms, that's getting the government to consider action on the problem, right? So think about the policy agenda. Think about the idea that at any given time, there are a lot of different interest groups out there. Uh, there are a lot of different individual members of Congress that are pushing certain ideas. There are a lot of events that are occurring that create new ideas. Uh, there are elections that force people, the, the composition of Congress to change, the presidency to change, and the agenda changes with all this. How do we end up with maybe three or four things being done in any given year in Congress? Well, you know, one of the things is when you study agenda setting that elections are very important. So, for example, we can say that we just have a new president after eight years of having democratic rule. There's been a fundamental disconnect between what the agenda of the Obama administration is and what the agenda of the Trump administration is. Elections have consequences, and those consequences shift the agenda. There can also be what we call focusing events, right? So every now and again something happens that changes the landscape of the policy community, and all of a sudden we stop talking about one issue and start talking about another. Uh, so, you know, September 11th, 19, uh, 2001, was one of those kind of uh, focusing events, right? We had for a while, had kind of this peace dividend in the end of the post-Cold War. America disassociated itself from the world. We're the only superpower. Things seemed to be going well. We didn't really have any major wars. And then we wake up and all of a sudden, uh, you know, after 9-11, which radically change kind of what goes on with the policy agenda under the Bush administration. Just one example of that is a reorganization of government. Uh, you know, we created the Department of Homeland Security. That was not something that was on the agenda prior to 9-11, right? So policy agendas change based on elections, uh, based on public opinion, uh, based on current events. Second thing is policy formation. And Anderson describes that as the development of a pertinent and acceptable course of action for dealing with a public problem. Uh, so in common sense English, that is what's proposed to be done about the problem. Now, you know, this makes the idea that something gets on the agenda and then we evaluate the different potential solutions to this, right? In reality, what happens is potential solutions exist even before something gets on the agenda, right? So people are always writing about what can we do about terrorism? You know, what can we do about poverty? Uh, what can we do about immigration? Uh, what actually happens at stage number two is, you know, you sift through some of those proposals and try to find something that works, which gets us to stage three, which is policy adoption. Uh, and again, with Anderson, that's the development 
of support for a specific proposal so that a policy can be legitima uh, legitimized or authorized. And again, the common sense, interest, uh, common sense explanation is getting the government to accept a particular solution to the problem. So at this point, uh, you know, because particularly the House of Representatives is a more majoritarian institution, if you can get more than 50% to go along with that. Uh, the Senate, we've talked about Senate rules before, if you can get the Senate to agree with it, and the President signs off, bang, all of a sudden we've got ourselves some sort of new public policy. Now, oftentimes, you know, if you've taken some kind of introduction to American government class or something like that, that's usually where we stop. And we just assume at that point in time, everything's done. Congress wanted this, the President signed it, it gets passed on, policy works. Well, there are other important stages to study in the policy process. Particularly if you're interested in lobbying or advocacy, you may have lost at that policy adoption stage, but you still have chances to change the policy. And one of the ways to do that is in stage number four, which is the policy implementation stage. So again, Anderson defines this as the application of the policy by the government's administrative machinery. And again, the common sense explanation of that is applying the government's policy to the problem. So at this stage in implementation, we take something that Congress and the President have signed on to, and now usually some bureaucratic agency, whether it be at the federal level or the state or the local level, takes that public policy and enacts it. Right? And it's not always 100% completely clear how that's supposed to be enacted. There are various rules created by a bureaucracy uh, and those rules can fundamentally change what happens uh, to a public policy over time. And the implementation stage can actually be a very important part of the public policy process. We'll talk more about that later in the semester. And then finally, policy evaluation. Uh, and again, Anderson calls that efforts by the government to determine whether the policy was effective and why or why not. Plain English, did it work, right? So at this point in time, oftentimes congressional committees will get involved, uh, executive agencies will study things, interest groups will bring information to the table, people that have been affected by a public policy, hearings are held and you evaluate that policy. And then on an ongoing basis, that information comes back around next time we try to talk about whether this policy should be you know, changed or not. Right? So that's the overall policy process. Let's just focus in here uh, on the, let's say, stage two and stage three in looking at the policy process, because this is most germane, really, uh, to what we're interested in when we take a look at uh, Sinclair's uh, book chapter on the Affordable Care Act. Now, looking at this, Sinclair basically starts off and says, look, there's a textbook version of how a bill becomes a law. And I searched through, uh, you know, Googled, and tried to find what a textbook definition looks like, and this is exactly what it looks like, right? So if we take a look here, what you'll see is that uh, you've got the House and you've got the Senate, and they both have very similar processes to the way that this works. So if you take a look in the upper left-hand corner, a bill is introduced, right? And that bill gets introduced, and then it goes to a committee. And in those committees, they're all set up on the basis of public policy issues, right? It's referred to the committee, right? And once it's referred to the committee, then at that point in time, the committee looks at it, holds hearings, and at that point in time, they say, yeah, what do you say? We pass this on to the rest of Congress. And then it goes to the Rules Committee, and the Rules Committee sets up the terms for debate. And they'll say, yes, we're going to debate this for 20 hours, we're going to debate this for 10 hours, the Democrats get 10 hours, Republicans get 10 hours, and then we'll vote on it. At the end of that debate, there's a vote. In our case, because we have to have this become a law, basically half of or more of the people in the House of Representatives say, yes, let's pass this law. Now, simultaneously, on the other half, other side of the Capitol building, somebody introduced this law in the United States Senate, it was referred to a committee, and they hold uh, hearings, and they mark up the law, and then the committee says, yes, let's pass this on to the rest of the Senate, and then it goes out to the Senate for floor action. It gets passed, 
And then what we see is, oh, wait a second. There's a difference between what the House has passed and what the Senate's passed. Hmm. Let's make this an easy one, right? Let's say it's a transportation bill and the House has passed a transportation bill that's $150 billion and the Senate's passed a transportation bill that's $100 billion. Well, the leadership creates a conference committee. They say, okay, uh, you 10 people and you 10 people, 10 from the House, 10 from the Senate, you'll get together. We want you to argue this out. We want you to come up with a solution so that we can um, take this back to our body. And, you know, this being a monetary thing, guess what happens? You got $150 billion on the House side, you got $100 billion on the Senate side. What do you think they come up with a solution? $125 billion. At least that's our example. So the conference committee creates a bill that says we're going to say, oh, we, we had different numbers to begin with. Now what we're going to do is we're, let's spend $125 billion and that'll be good enough. We'll compromise. It goes back to the House. The House says, yeah, we wanted more money, but that's fine. We'll vote for that. The Senate says, ah, oh, we don't want to spend that much money, but I guess that's better than what they originally said. Fine, we'll vote for it. Then it goes to the president. The president says, yes, this is a job creating measure, signs it into law, and bang, that's your textbook process, right? Well, that obviously is a very easy process to understand, but that's not what Sinclair tells us oftentimes happen. And what she talks about is essentially over recent decades, it's been harder and harder to pass policy for some reasons that we've already talked about, like partisanship. And there are alternative methods to being able to pass legislation now. And that's where she comes up with the idea of unorthodox lawmaking, new legislative processes in the US Congress. So uh, the story that you have actually is from the fifth, fourth edition. Uh, this is a newer edition. Uh, and what I'd like you to do as you go through and take a look at the chapter on the Affordable Care Act is to focus in essentially on how non-traditional that is. You know, we just saw this idea of the textbook, how a bill becomes a law. In reality, when you take a look at the way that the Affordable Care Act was passed, it has nothing to do with this little model that you see here. And that's important for us to remember as we think about the legislative process. Uh, it's also important to remember that this is a major piece of legislation, uh, probably the largest piece of social legislation that's been passed since the 1960s during the Great Society. Uh, so, you know, it's interesting to see how the process worked itself out with the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and uh, that's what we'll try to take a look at. So enjoy your Sinclair reading.